Well, I'm hoping that my talk is going to segue from these very, this recent discussion about um, you know, levels of, of homology and, and the, um, the suggestion that behavior is important. I'm really a behaviorist, and I'm interested in tracing the evolution of a cognitive trait. And in, I'm going to specifically focus on the cognitive map. And present today, uh, I thought this would be a good forum to throw out something new and wild and, uh, and unsupported by data. But it, in, it, in the spirit of the last discussion, I think it'll be, it'll be interesting to see, uh, to, to do it as a, as a Gedanken experiment. So I want to um, talk about the case of the cognitive map. The outline, uh, I want to talk about um, the cognitive map, what it is, uh, non, how to navigate, give a little primer first on navigation. Talk about then my particular contribution to this debate, splitting the cognitive map into parallel components. Then describing how these parallel components are um, actually um, encoded by hippocampal substrates and what the neuroecology of the relationship between navigation and hippocampal, uh, hippocampus and medial pallium homologs um, is. Then address the harder question, the new data on animals that don't have hippocampus that seem to be cognitive mapping. Asking then, what can the common denominator be? And what I'm going to propose is the olfactory system. And that the olfactory system actually has, I would say, representational parallels that could have led to the evolution of, of associative spatial learning. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm going to propose, is that you could start with um, one behavior, chemotaxis, and you end up with a much more general uh, cognitive trait uh, associative spatial learning. Okay. So the cognitive map was introduced by Edward Tolman in 1949 in a response to behaviorists arguing that the, the rat could, in fact, create a survey representation of its environment something beyond a chain of stimuluses and a stimuli, uh, responses to stimuli. Interestingly, at the same time, Gustav Kramer in Germany was studying the homing pigeon. And although they weren't um, citing each other's work, at the same time, he was suggesting the same thing, that homing pigeons, when released in, from novel release points, could orient back to the home loft, and the only way they could do that is by having a survey representation, something that had a map where they also had a sense of direction on that map, and so therefore they could compute the, the home vector. This all became very exciting in 1978 when, well, it was 71, when John O'Keefe discovered place cells in the hippocampus, and O'Keefe and Nadell suggested that um, synthesized the data and suggesting that the cognitive map was actually being encoded by the hippocampus, and and the rest is the rest is history. Definition from ethological point of um, perspective is the ability to shortcut across novel space in absence of known landmarks. Uh, an animal that might navigate to this location of landmarks on one day uh, might navigate to this location on another day being placed there can make a, a vector, a direct vector, from one uh, area of landmarks to the other. Okay. Just to talk a little bit about navigation, the navigational um, umfeld is, um, I've, I've begun uh, calling this with Randolph um, Menzel, is that a typical natural scene has a number of sources of diverse sources of information. Um, celestial, the sun, the location of the sun, the distribution of polarized E vectors across the sky because of the sun, auditory gradients from turbulence in a stream. 
magnetic, geomagnetic fields, olfactory uh, plumes, all of these are um, what all of these stimuli have in common is that they're not discrete sources of information. They are all graded stimuli. And what's going to become critical here is that the stimuli have to be encoded representationally by the animal actually moving in space to take repeated samples. And then from that, compute a, a gradient um, vector. Okay. So that's what I call, uh, Francois Schenk and I made this distinction between cues in the world that are directional and positional. And these graded stimuli are, we, we define them not by how big they are, but by their function, which in this case is they're being primarily used for direction. You can also um, move, a, 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 you can have a single object like a beacon, which uh, in the case of the sun has to be compensated by a sense of time using the sun compass, which of course was Gustav Kramer's uh, great uh, discovery. But, in, but for these graded stimuli, to create that vector, you have to sample at these uh, different um, times. And the important thing about a graded stimulus is that you, it can be extrapolated. So you can miss samples, and if you've got, if you computed a vector up to that point, you can um, go on the other side of an obstacle and with an expectation of what the gradient value is going to be on the other side. And dynamic, and this is important because in the real world, information is very dynamic. We we shouldn't get um, misled by studying spatial navigation in the lab because, in fact, in most uh, vertebrates that we're studying are faced with uh, visual and celestial landmarks will, be, will change hourly with weather, they'll change daily with time of day, they'll change seasonally with changes in vegetation, snow cover, and so that all these in all the, the landmarks um, have to be tracked both uh, the graded stimuli have to be are tracked both as you're creating the vector but then also over these different time periods the other class of cues are positional cues which primarily are giving positional information which are discrete objects that are have to be are uniquely defined by features. They're what we normally talk about as um, local objects. It's an object where the percept changes rapidly with the approach, the aspect changes with approach. That rapid change in aspect, of course, is a cue to distance. And so with a positional object, it's, you can measure your distance uh, among the objects and yourself to the object as opposed to a, uh, a beacon, for example, like a mountain range where it's being you're using, used, used as a compass, but you can't use it to calculate your distance to that object. And the, it cannot be extrapolated, so that's a weakness of this class of cues, and it has to be learned. Um, again, the both the positional cues, and here's an example of positional cue is an animal linking trajectories between different uh, objects to uh, reach, reach a goal, as in route following. But these local cues are more subject to change over time where cues might be added to an array or the cues might uh, move around in an array. Francois Schenk and I, in 2003, suggested that the cognitive map is the computation that emerges from the flexible use of these two classes of cues, directional and positional cues. That the, there is an underlying scaffold, a, the bearing map, 
which is employing directional cues to create grids, bicoordinate or multi-coordinate grids, of graded stimuli. This underlying, for example, um, geomagnetic field or olfactory field or olfactory um, plumes. The, on, superimposed on top of that, on that scaffold, are the sketch maps, which are ephemeral maps of local landmarks, of constellations of local landmarks, where what the animal is paying attention to is the, the change in time in that constellation. It isn't um, the, the, the individual objects are, in fact, can be learned easily and, in fact, don't even require the hippocampus. With, um, but the, the, um, the hallmark of hippocampal spatial learning is this ability to track change in time and space, not just space, but, but time also. So when you have the, um, the bearing map acting as a scaffold, then it, it's a, you can, um, it produces a common coordinate system for the objects in the sketch maps. And so then they actually can be encoded with at x, y position on, on, the, on the bearing map. And when you have that, you, that allows shortcutting between known positions. And again, Gustav Kramer suggested the map hypothesis in, in the 50s, and Hans Wallraff, studying the homing pigeon, suggested that this bi-coordinate map must, is, is they're creating a bi-coordinate map with olfactory information. Ken Lohman has been studying this idea in, this, in the um, sea turtles with a, um, demonstrating their use of geomagnetic fields to, um, and to, in, to read off local position from geomagnetic bi-coordinate maps composed of um, orthogonal um, lines of uh, magnetic inclination and intensity. So the bi-coordinate idea, um, that's, not, that's not new. What we added to it was the idea that the cognitive map actually ha is is um, a flexible representation that can either be um, localizing the animal in terms of a bearing map or localizing in terms of the sketch maps. And further, we assigned it to a hippocampal substrate. This is um, a basic, everyone has a different map of the hippocampus. This is, if, um, it kind of tells you a lot about your world view. This is Romani Cajal, of course. But in this kind of generalized map of the hippocampus, the, um, what, what we noticed by, uh, is that the, um, there was a, there's actually a, a very large bilateral projection from the CA3 field to the lateral septum, which had been proposed to be part of um, the um, motor system. And what um, we proposed is that this circuit here, the, with, from the um, dentate gyrus um, CA3 and out to lateral septum, could be possibly the primitive substrate for the bearing map because those components are found in, in all vertebrates. So what we suggested was that the bearing map requires the dentate gyrus, the medial septum, which in, in mammals produces a, a theta rhythm, which we suggested is acting as a pacemaker to, for measuring distance. And of course, that's been, um, Yorji um, Bujaki's work has, has been elegantly um, demonstrating exactly that. And with the, the output, um, with the, media, the lateral septum. And our paper in 2003 surveys a very large literature of physiological, genetic, um, behavioral experiments uh, supporting this idea that if you lesion impair a part of that circuit, you, are, you lose a sense of direction, but you retain a sense of place. In contrast, the sketch map 
which is um, embodied by the, the, the CA1 subfield, computes snapshots of these positional cues in time to extract a pattern over events. So this leading to um, wa um, why CA1 is so important in event recording and episodic memory is because what it's doing is the same sampling over time, just at a different um, time scale. And the integrative map uh, brings them together. The CA3 um, field integrates the two. And, and so this, this is an abstract representation of what the integrated map might look like, where you have this underlying scaffold, the bearing map, where new um, gradients are being, new graded stimuli are being mapped by taking successive samples and adding more gradients and more vectors to the map, increasing its resolution, where the sketch maps are paying attention to the local cues, the discrete local cues, and the constellations of the local cues, and how these local cues are changing, and um, both in, in the location, the unique object place locations. And this dichotomy the, of, between the bearing and sketch map function actually neatly captures the, the difference in encoding of a space by polygamous rodents of different, spe of different sexes, and I won't talk about that, but that's the, the, the bearing map function is, is something that is, is the, um, the preferred, the heavily weighted mapping strategy of males, whereas the sketch map function is the heavily weighted uh, mapping strategy of, of females. So recent work, um, not from, from, um, from Denise Manahan Vaughan, she has found that subfields respond to different cue types, and particularly, she's been um, documenting how dentate gyrus uh, facilitates, is um, long-term depression is facilitating the dentate gyrus by this type of cue, but in the CA1 by this type of cue, and recently she's just shown a double dissociation in the CA3 field showing both um, the mossy fiber, which is the projection to the, hip, to the dentate, is LTD is facilitated by the, la the, the, the large directional cue, and the um, associational um, fibers are, LTD is facilitated by the positional cues. So I think there's, um, there's growing support from different levels of analysis for this idea of the parallel maps. What about other vertebrates? We, there's little agreement on subfields. So if parallel maps d is, requires um, subfield assignment, what we've got is um, a, a homologous structure throughout vertebrates, but we don't know, we, we can't assign subfields. So that's, that's um, we, don't, we do know, however, that the medial pallium homolog size correlates with navigational demand, and this has now been found, both sex and species and differences in fish rodents, um, reptiles, uh, birds, et cetera, uh, a growing uh, laundry list of being able to predict medial pallium homolog size with navigational demand, specifically with the need to integrate over time and space, not simply the amount of space you're covering, but the need to sample different locations at different times and be able to either shortcut between them or integrate what's happening across these two times. Okay, and of course, in cognitive mapping, and in, in, particularly in flying mammals and, and flying birds, has been recently dramatically demonstrated in um, cross-continental displacements where birds were flown on commercial jetliners to across the country and released, and experienced adults uh, corrected for, their, uh, for this displacement. And naive juveniles did not. In uh, white-crowned sparrows, the, um, the Egyptian fruit bat was recently shown to be released in the middle of a desert in Israel and show a similar uh, ability. So it's, it's a, 
the cognitive mapping is most dramatically seen in the field in these uh, wild, in these flying animals that are moving over large areas and have to integrate many um, graded stimuli. But not only do we can't um, locate the subfields in other vertebrate taxa, but now we have evidence in in both um, crustacean and insects that, they, that cognitive mapping can now uh, be demonstrated in animals without a uh, medial palium, without a hippocampus at all. So, what, so I think this is, th then we really have to um, ask, what is the common denominator of, com of, um, of the cognitive map across such a wide um, range of taxa and nervous systems? And one, this is my, um, this is the big leap. One common denominator is that the olfactory system is remarkably similar, and this has been noted and studied in, in, um, by many, many authors and, and uh, recently at all levels um, of the sensory neuron and the wiring diagrams that all the, the um, chemical stim um, odorants are really a primeval stimulus and there is this enormous olfactory con convergence across, um, across taxa. The glomerular structure in particular, uh, Heather Eisten demonstrates that, that this is probably conver convergence across um, these wide range of taxa, simply absent in the, in the nematode. So what is special about Olfaction and how could that be related to the cognitive map? I know that sounds like a bit of a jump. The very interesting thing about olfaction is that it doesn't act like other stimuli. For example, if you um, have a odorant and you change the concentration, you can have um, that just changing the concentration can produce a qualitative change in the percept so that literally the apple becomes an orange becomes a rose with increases in, in concentration. Odorants are also infinitely combinatorial, uh, combinatorial and non-deterministic. Even a pheromone can be used as a, 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 arbit a neutral stimulus and then conditioned in honeybee um, olfactory learning. A mixture, an odorant mixture, is, can be simultaneously uh, um, perceived as a unique odor object where the components cannot be uh, distinguished. And this is true. This has been shown in humans, uh, crustacean, insects. But it can also, in other cases, and the, the mechanism appears to be an intentional one, the, the same mixture can be, ex can be understood in terms of elements, which means the, the, um, you have a point. You, uh, when it's an element, you have a point and a gradient. So imagine. You've um, got you've you've got a an odorant mixture. You can either use it as an element and then therefore construct a, a gradient of as you move the intensity is changing over time and space, or you can if 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 these two axes are two different odorants that are mixing at different points in this x y grid that the specific mixture has a different qualitative percept. And so as you're moving through this elemental space, you actually come upon unique odor, you know, odorant landmarks that you can actually recognize your location on this map because you have reached that unique odorant landmark, which you know from, from your ability to decompose it into elements that you are at a certain concentration of the two odorants. And this is, um, again, this has is, this is, uh, been triggered this enormous um, research in configural learning versus elemental learning, and it's been very well studied in honeybees, humans, rats, and, um, and, and uh, lobsters, actually. So that structure, in fact, is a parallel map structure. So here's um, a scenario, a possible scenario, that if, you, if, if we all agree that probably the most primeval um, stimulus used for spatial orientation is, is chem our chemical um, odorants, certainly found already in prokaryotes, that these chemical odorants have, are both a directional cue where the elements, repeated sample of an element, 
produces a, on the concentration gradient can produce a vector. At the same time, it simultaneously can be a positional cue where any, mix, any one mixture is perceived as a whole and a unique whole. And, and, and these unique synthetic um, holes are actually not, they can be close together in this elemental space and yet not be similar. That's been a, just a very interesting um, observation of the olfactory uh, per percept. So if an animal can switch back and forth, they can therefore um, both um, they can they can be map they can recognize their location in this map by the detection of these synthetic objects. If you then add valency, and which is the it is as this evolved, you would imagine positive and negative valency to that. You have a very powerful representation with only an olfactory stimulus where you've got, you can actually have a emotional or a valency landscape um, that you're moving around. And again, we're thinking of this as Precambrian, small animals moving in space, trying to find food and avoid predation. And just using this odorant um, computation could actually create an, a, a, um, a map where, and they could also extrapolate from their current location to new um, odor objects, and if those new odor objects were in that positive valency part of the elemental map, then they could categorize and, um, and generalize about the value of a new odor and object by its location in an elemental map. So to recap, um, this is starting from chemotaxis, which gives you both positional and directional cues, then you can add valency, and then you can categorize, and then you could produce maybe a chemospatial landscape. Certainly, by the time we get into the Cambrian explosion from um, Burgess Shale here, you, you'd have all of these things would be in place. The problem, of course, everyone, is, is the turbulence. Turbulence is a terrible problem. Odorants are notoriously labile in, in air, more so than water, but, but very much so in water. Plumes break up into filaments. but if perhaps we could bootstrap this, if you think about the the, ur, um, the pre Cambrian um, animal is going to be very small, and therefore it's the ratio of its body to the plume is going to be advantageous. It's going to be moving within a filament. And so the competitive advantage of having any kind of associative map of space, being able to decode any information, predict the resources, would could lead to the further innovation of solving the turbulence problem by calibrating the chemospatial map by, with non-chemical non stimuli, such as magnetic fields or light or temperature. That would anchor the map to the static world for the first time. The previous world is a, is a cloud of, of, of odorants that the animal is maybe very um, uh, adaptively orienting in, in but it's, it's, um, it's, it has no relationship to the actual um, absolute space. So once you've, you can anchor that, because you, to anchor it to solve the, the problem of turbulence, then suddenly that would have this amazing, the much a greater um, advantage, probably leading to greater predation efficiency, greater body size, then you um, um, then you're really moving from that into spatial associative learning um, with the first allocentric space. So it, representing what Tolman said as a cognitive map, the space outside the body of, of the animal and the, and the animal itself moving in that space. And I just want to point out, um, actually related to Nippon's um, talk, is that there's amazing diversity of odor sensing stimuli, uh, um, appendages in marine um, arthropods and the, um, the feedback between the mechanosensory inputs is critical for decoding olfactory location. For example, in sharks, the lateral line system is necessary to decode o um, odor plumes. And I would imagine that similarly these um, this, this diversity of appendages could be used to work with the odorant plume to, uh, as, as in rats and in lobsters, where they control the input by the rate of sniffing the t um, and, the, and which um, olfactory sen uh, sensors are being exposed at any time to, during, during a sniff or an tenual um, flick. 
So this, of course, would be a great advantage. And um, Ginsburg and Yablanka have already suggested perhaps the evolution of associative learning is one is a hypothesis to explain the uh, Cambrian explosion. And if we think in animal behavior, what the um, the basic tenet of behavior is animal adaptive behaviors are, are um, governed by the distribution of resources and time and space. Being an animal that can map these resources is going to have a, a large selective advantage and suddenly it's information is going to be the innovation and where you've got this, this massive uh, adaptive radiation of everyone solving um, that problem all based on the underlying structure of L-faction. But getting back to our discussion just now, many convergent solutions to this, many different solutions depending on the, um, on, on, on the, 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 the starting conditions, yet with a um, still striking now present day homolog uh, um, similarities in, in structure and uh, in, in this olfactory system. So this implications for, for vertebrates, well, and, um, one is that the olfactory bulb is actually very important in navigation, maybe not just discrimination, and that the reason that only in mammals we only have olfactory, I mean, adult neurogenesis in the hippocampus dentate gyrus, the substrate for the bearing map, and the olfactory bulb is that these two structures are working together to um, constantly creating that, um, that bearing map. And in fact, running increases hippocampal neurogenesis, but not olfactory neurogenesis. Odor enrichment has the opposite effect. So I think that um, that would, and that would, um, um, something that we really haven't uh, investigated is what the dentate gyrus is doing with this odor information and how is it um, actually mapping it. The other, uh, the neuroecology of olfactory bulbs, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, variation in olfactory bulbs. In carnivores, you have increased olfactory bulb size in, in, with home range. Theropod dinosaurs, it was thought that you know, birds have small olfactory bulbs, and well, now it turns out that, that modern birds secondarily have reduced their olfactory bulb size, and actually, uh, this, is, this is from George's um, a, a textbook, but that's the, olfactory, the relative size of the olfactory bulb to the brain in um, T. rex suggests that there's some, some the more than just discrimination for these active predators. And I would suggest these, the, the, it's these active predators who have to actually have the strongest demand for mapping in space, space and time. Birds, olfactory size, it increases when you switch from vision to um, non-vision to nocturnal birds have larger olfactory bulbs. Echolocating um, bats, um, on the other hand, they're nocturnal, but there's a massive reduction in echolocating bats. Again, arguing that because their auditory system is doing the na navigation, they, they're not using olfactory information. Pigeons, homing pigeons, despite um, they have a larger hippocampus and a larger olfactory bulbs than other um, pigeon strains, there's a huge amount of work on pigeons by um, Floriano Poppy, Walruff, and their colleagues showing that the um, the, the, the most, at, the necessary um, condition for a pigeon to, to show true cognitive mapping is to have olfactory information. And if any part of the olfactory system is compromised, they are impaired in their navigation. And it was, this was competing with magnet, magnetic um, field perception. It's very clear now you can actually lesion um, the magnetic the tri trigeminal nerve versus the olfactory nerve, and the, what it, the, the important, um, um, the baseline, the scaffold for navigation in the homing pigeon is, a, is olfaction, despite the fact that the, the, the pigeon is, birds are incredibly visual species. They can, um, they're visual savants, despite their, their, we think of them as visual animals, yet they need to navigate with olfaction. Theoretical implications was, this is um, Daniel Osario, Wayne Getz, and Jürgen Ryback said in 94, they pointed this out, that um, olfaction it was a really good place if you want to build a brain. And that as, as the, um, beca perhaps because olfaction dem demands a neural architecture pre-adapted to learning complex input, input patterns, that this would be, um, this, this is a great place to start, and this and the um, the brain actually 
complex brains evolved the way they did because they began with olfaction, because of the sovereignty of olfaction. Another theoretical question is that of scaling, as the, the Finlay, um, Barbara Finlay and Darlington models have shown so elegantly, the olfactory bulb marches to its own drummer. It, it, um, it does not, uh, it is not, it is the only um, structure that does not uh, obey the late is large um, uh, rules. And what if, if in fact, but their recent um, 2011 paper were suggesting that the, um, the, the function of um, the, this plasticity of late is large in cortex and cerebellum could, is actually an adaptive uh, computational structure for not disrupting the basic command line where the, um, the new innovations are coming on top of the line, but they're not coming in the middle of the line, which would disrupt it. And in fact, that's, so that's exactly what um, this spatial navigational system could be, this primeval basic command line that um, then has other innovations around it, but it actually um, maintains its phenotypic plasticity to be able to uh, adapt to ecological demands. Uh, because, the ch because of changes in, in resources, you have to be able to continually map that and, uh, and keep your mapping abilities always up to par. So this would be a um, conclusion. What I'm saying is that olfaction is, a, um, is something that we might want to reconsider in terms of its navigational function. That it has a very, it perhaps has a very special percept because of the way it's it's done, and perhaps it um, all animal uh, um, and or the way it's it deco it encoded by by animals by diverse taxa, and this acts as an armature, which then can lead to bootstrapping with um, increase in selective advantage, being able to map increases in brain size, allocentric spatial um, mapping, which at that really is a cognitive revolution. But it still remains this basic command line in, in vertebrates, which is where you, so, and this is why you see the patterns of convergent um, evolution of, of neuroecological patterns that, that you do. But it's, and the parallel map structure of um, the hippocampus is simply an instantiation of this underlying um, logic, just happens to be that's the way it's done in the medial pallium uh, in, in vertebrates. And this is just a gratuitous um, uh, picture of an intelligent. Uh, dinosaur. Okay, so th that's that's it. Um, many thanks. I'd like to uh, acknowledge Francois Schenk for my co-author on the um, parallel map theory. Uh, been a lot of discussion on these ideas with Randolph Menzel at, at um, in Berlin and Leslie Kay at Chicago. Also Bob Full, um, my colleague at, at Berkeley, and Dan Kotechuk and, and Camilo Taylor. We're being funded now by NSF to um, come up with a kind of integrated. Uh, solution for uh, robot cognition, and that's how the, this came out of these discussions and, and my students. And I want to just end with this quote, which I think is, is, a, is a, it's a lovely philosophy. It's also specific to the idea of learning by moving through space is the great thing in the world is not so much where we stand, but in what direction we're moving. Thank you very much.